Hi, everybody. Can people hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, great. Um, so I guess, okay, great. So we have um, Iran's here too. Um, okay, we have Stacy has her hand up. <laughs> so I see that in the chat. Um, great. So I think welcome to the CGSI uh, special session at Recom. Um, it's quite a, a, quite a journey for CGSI this summer. And we're really happy that we have a great turnout of 100 people. Um, before we start, can I see um, who in, um, who in C, I, we'll, we'll, well, I'll ask in a few minutes again, as people are getting here, but who in the, um, in the audience is a CGSI alumni who's been to CGSI before? So raise your hand if you're one of them. Okay, nice. Yeah, we have a good, good turnout of our of our community. Great. It's going down though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. Okay. Okay, let's get, okay, so let's get started. So, um, Iran, you wanna start, start us off? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so, uh, we wanted to basically start by just giving uh, uh, the people that haven't been to CGSI kind of an idea of what, what it is. Uh, and uh, basically what Elazar and I will go through this together. Uh, and so basically CGSI is, is a summer school that we do every year and it's kind of a hybrid between a conference and a, and a, and a school, um, which means that basically it's, the idea is that it gives kind of uh, outreach education, but also uh, the experts can kind of, uh, in, in each of the fields, are basically able to learn uh, on their own field from, from their uh, peers and colleagues. Uh, and uh, the basic idea is to combine uh, essentially academic uh, talks together with community building. And this is kind of the picture that you see here are kind of are all essentially taken from passage size. Uh, it's been going on since, uh, I think now is the, uh, essentially this year is the fifth year, <laughs> so, uh, which is virtual. Um, so we have it for five years. Every year we have it for a month. Uh, and, you know, some people stay for the entire month and some people just stay for a few days. A week. Uh, we, a week. Go ahead, Elza. So, some people come for a full week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so this is, uh, there's two programs. One of them is a long program where people stay for a month and uh, that's about 40 people typically. And then there's uh, the short, short programs that basically people come for a week and um, they're, you know, it's still, it's a relatively small group. So even when, you know, people come for a week, it's typically, uh, you know, at most 100, maybe 150 people. Uh, but we try to kind of uh, organize it in a way that everybody is engaged and everybody kind of uh, has a chance to, to meet everyone else during that time. Um, so Elza, maybe you want to continue to the yeah, next so, one. Yeah, so let me, um, so I want to just, just what is the, the scope of CGSI is on methods and genomics. And I think what's unique uh, about CGSI is that the focus of it is on methods across different areas of genomics. So the, the audience that's there, people work in cancer genomics, transcriptional genomics, statistical genetics, population genetics, structural biology. It's a real broad mix of areas. And but it, it because the talks really focus on methods, there's a lot of methods that you know are kind of new arising 
that are really relevant across the uh, areas. And, be, and in addition, the speakers really design their talks to be accessible to a methods audience um, in a different area. So uh, actually a lot of students over the years, participants in CGSI have really gone to CGSI and ended up doing a postdoc in a different field in their research, you know, like in a methods, and partly because they kind of got exposure to it at CGSI. And the talks are really split into two different categories. We have research talks, which kind of cut, capture kind of new research, but again, are made accessible to individuals who are maybe a little bit outside of the field, as well as tutorials to bring people up to speed and you know who are people in, in, in methods areas in one field and want to kind of start potentially working in another area. So in addition, we, you know, the meeting could be big, maybe a hundred people, it's not that big. But one of the things that we do is we break people up into small groups, like called affinity groups. Um, these are small groups that really, you know, about 12 people or so. And uh, it creates the, the feeling of like kind of a small kind of intimate meeting. These groups meet kind of every day uh, in, in the session. They, people present their own research there and people really get to know people at other institutions that have very similar research interests, uh, in, you know, from, from these, these groups. Faculty also um, are involved in them as well. Uh, Ron, you want to take over this one? Uh, yeah, so uh, one kind of big part of uh, CGSI is what we call community building. Uh, and that's why we actually, that's one of the reasons we decided this year to just have a small session and not the full thing, because we think that basically that's a really kind of a, a major part of, of uh, CGSI. Uh, and hey, go back to the coffee. <laughs> yeah, so, so the t you know, we, we typically, the schedule is, you know, maybe five talks every day. Each talk is about 45 minutes. And in between the talks, we have uh, long coffee breaks, uh, you know, uh, long lunch break. And the idea is to basically have people be able to engage with, with other people in the community and, and get to know each other and, um, and talk about work. Uh, there is a very good turnout to the, to the talks. So basically most people go to all the talks because there is not, 10 talks a day, there's only five. Uh, and so, uh, so you have kind of the time that people go to the talks and then the, the, the rest of the time we have a lot of uh, coffee, food, uh, dinner, and you know what not. Want to go to the next one? Yeah, so the, the community building, actually the first part of, uh, of the CGSI every year is, is starting with the retreat that we do uh, in uh, Big Bear, which is about two hours from LA. Uh, these are kind of mountains uh, that, you know, it's a ski resort in the, in the winter and in the summer there's the lakes and we can hike and there's, uh, we do, uh, uh, we go over, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, talks. And again, this is only, that's only the long program participants, the one, the people that stay for the entire month. So that gives them a chance to know each other and, you know, for a few days that they're basically all the time in the same place. And also, I want to just add, like, you know, the, the faculty themselves are a real mix of different levels of seniority, anywhere from junior faculty that just started their job to, you know, very senior people in the field. And actually, in the, in the, um, the last year, and the plan was this year as well, but that will now be next year, is that the retreat actually really highlights a lot of uh, faculty who just started their careers. In fact, like for Last year, many of the, um, uh, fac the CGSI was the first place that the faculty were ever invited as faculty. And so we had a very good kind of spirit of like young, young faculty who were kind of the core members of the retreat program. Ron, yeah. Yeah, next one. Uh, and then during the, during the week, uh, the, during the month, basically, uh, except for the weekends, we almost every day we have some uh, social activities, including, you know, picnics on the beach and, you know, some sports uh, at the beach and then uh, some uh, concerts. I think if you go to the next slide, 
Uh, food on the beach, right? Yeah, yeah. Food on the beach, soccer at the beach. So there's lots of yeah. pizzas. Uh, my car smelled like pizza for like a month. That, after yeah, this. that's my car. That's my car. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, you know, some, uh, we go to the Hollywood Bowl typically every, every year. So this is kind of a big concert hall outside. Um, and, um, uh, and we go, uh, you know, to different places in, uh, in the LA area that are kind of uh, LA monuments. So if you go, you know, Santa Monica Pier, to go to the next slide. Santa Monica Pier, we went to the Santa Monica Pier. Uh, we went to uh, the observatory, Hollywood. Um, and uh, John November always comes with a van that looks like this. So you can actually <laughs> get into one of these like 60s uh, vans. Um, and um, uh, it's, so that's basically the idea. This year we uh, had a very nice list of people that uh, agreed to come and, and give talks. Um, and obviously because of um, COVID, which is the next slide, um, we had to make it essentially uh, um, essentially cancel it and basically have this, this uh, session that we have right now instead. Um, but you know, we hope to come back next year, and this is not going to be become kind of the the normal. Yeah, we um, we actually got our, our, our program funded um, again. Our grant got renewed, so the plan is to extend the program at least through 2025, um, but probably now 2026 because we have a canceled one that we're delaying. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity. You know, we're really excited to um, partner with Recom for, because we think, you know, if you look at the speakers here, the, a lot of these people, you know, some of them are from the Recom community, some of them are from outside the community, but, you know, um, all these people are talking really about methods. And so we really think that the Recom community is really a group that um, is, is, is a group that is, uh, uh, would really benefit from our program and there's a lot of synergy. And similarly, a lot of people in our um, program would, uh, from CTSI, would really benefit from coming to Recom and 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 uh, uh, you know going. And I have to say that Fabio is actually one of our um, one of our faculty. And so he, you know, we feel like you know had you know you'll only see this next year, but there would have been some touches that uh, of the program that would have been definitely influenced by CGSI had the program become a person. We can take credit for those because, you know, he got some of those ideas from uh, his participation in CGSI. Um, so the steering committee is, uh, includes John November, Ben Raphael, and Dino Shchenko, who's, uh, this is from, uh, you know, from different institutions, even though the program is holding UCLA, it's from, uh, from, uh, all over. Um, this year, our organizing committee is is Lisa Bastrash, Suram Sankarman, James Zhu, and Noah Zaitlin. Uh, we'll be hearing from Lisa and James as talks in a little bit. Um, and Aaron, you want to introduce the staff? So. Uh, yeah, so basically we uh, essentially, the, this this kind of uh, working on CGSI is basically working uh, around uh, the entire year, not just the, the summer itself. And this is all uh, being managed by our, our staff, including uh, uh, Stacy, Samantha, Stefania, and Leticia. Um, so, and they, they are the ones actually that help organize also this session. So we thank them. And uh, I think we're ready for a talk. So uh, James Zhu is gonna be the first talk. So one of the things we do in, uh, in CGSI uh, we have uh, a very kind of informal setting. So basically people introduce themselves. So with this, you know, continuing this tradition, we'll let James uh, introduce himself. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, and can you see the slides? Yeah, we see that. Yeah, we see that. Okay, great. 
Yeah, so hi, I'm, I'm James. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford. Um, and I have to say, so CTSI is really one of my very favorite programs. I'm very happy that despite the challenges that we're still able to have a, a virtual session this year. And I hope to see everyone, see all of you again next year. So for this um, presentation, so it will be a mixture of tutorials class research presentation. Right? So I want to talk about how can we use some of the recent advances in computer vision right, to capture and to model spatial and temporal dynamics in genomics. Right? And it's based on a lot of the recent work that we've been doing in my group. Right? So to set the stage, I just want to, you to take a moment and to just to look at this picture here on the screen. Right. And just imagine that this is like one of the potential patients that you're talking to. Right. So there's a lot of information that's very rich information that's in the image. Okay. So the next part of the exercise now is that, okay, so I take the image away. Right. And now you have to actually use words and numbers and standard phenotypes to describe this image. Right. So if you think about that for a second, it's actually really hard to do. Right, because there's a lot of information that's maybe in the image, with the image is hard to capture if you try to write it down precisely. And conversely, right, if you have not seen this image before, and someone just give you a list of standard phenotypes, maybe some features, it also will be very hard to precisely imagine what this face will look like. Right. So this is a very simple example, but hopefully it illustrates that there's a tremendous amount of rich information that are captured by our human, human vision, which is actually very hard to capture in written notes, right, in medical records, or in standard phenotypes. And this is even more so when we're looking at smaller scale objects. Right? So here I have an example of an ultrasound of the heart, also a biopsy sample of, from, camera, from cancer tumors, and even a video of microglia cell type. Right? So for these smaller objects, it's even more challenging for us to write down what are the, the, the features and the phenotypes to describe them. And we simply just do not have to really the right vocabulary to really describe these, to explain these features. So the goal of this talk is to, to demonstrate how we can leverage some of the recent advances that we've been making in computer vision, right, to do kind of deep digital phenotypings of these different physical scales and to learn to essentially like a new language for different morpho morphology and for dynamics. Okay, and I'm especially interested, I think as many of you are, right, in connecting this kind of visual information with genomics, right, because then if we can do that, then this would allow us to integrate morphology with molecular mechanisms. And people often describe genomics as sort of the book, Right, so essentially now what we're trying to do is that we want to see the movie that's based on this book. Right, and the movie oftentimes contains uh, a lot more information. Okay, so the roadmap for the talk is that I want to go through sort of three examples. So in the first example, I will give you sort of a, an example application of how can we use computer vision for phenotyping. Right, this will be for the ultrasound of the heart. And then I'll to show you how we can take similar kinds of technologies, similar algorithms of computer vision, and then apply that to actually study spatial transcriptomics and also to study morphodynamic changes in videos, microscopy videos of cells. Okay, so the first example is um, to really just to help to illustrate uh, how we can actually use computer vision for phenotyping. So I'll tell you about our recent work actually building a video-based AI system to assess heart function. Uh, and this is based on this paper that we published recently uh, in Nature a couple of months ago. And the work is led by David Oyan and Brian Kluwe, who are two fantastic researchers in my group. So the context for this problem is that you know, heart disease is actually the leading cause of death in the US. And the most, the one of the most routine and common ways that people used to actually assess how well the heart is functioning is actually by taking this kind of ultrasound, right? So the example here is given in this, in this uh, slide. And effectively, what the cardiologist, the sonographer is looking at, right, is they're looking at this chamber in the heart, and they're looking at when the chamber when it's the largest and when it's the smallest, right? The size of the chamber when it's largest and when it's the smallest. And because the heart is effectively, you know, a pump, so by looking at how, how much the volume changes from the largest to the smallest, 
you can actually get a good estimate of how much power and how well the, this heart pump is functioning. So the process is actually quite expensive, right? And a lot of it's really driven by sort of human vision. So it's routinely done. There are over 10 million of these ultrasounds done in the US every year. And each one would typically cost over a thousand dollars. So the challenge with this is that it's very much relying on human vision, right? Um, because the cardiologist would have to actually physically identify the, the, the frame of the video when the heart is the most expanded, the frame when it's the most contracted, and then manually segment out the frames. Right? So again, it's a very rich information that's in this ultrasound video, but based on human vision, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's also quite variable across different clinicians. Okay, so what we did in this work is to actually, now I think this is a, uh, quite a well-suited problem for computer vision, right? So we developed a computer vision system to basically to, to mimic every step of the human cardiologist's workflow and to do these automatic assessments of the heart function. So the left here is basically what an input ultrasound would look like. Right? And, um, and the, the right, will be an output from our vision-based algorithm versus so automatically doing the segmentations and it's, you know, in real time, sort of assessing how large is the heart and how much volume and how much power is generated by the heart. Now diving a little bit more into the, kind of the technologies here. So again, I want to present this in a fairly high level, but the main point here is that this kind of technologies can, as we'll demonstrate, can be used in, you know, in genomic applications that I'll show you in a few slides. So the kind of technology we basically have two components, right? So the bottom arm here, right? It's in the second row here. It's basically trying to do the automatic vision segmentation. So it's basically an object detection problem where we're trying to detect what's the relevant chamber of the heart and then try to keep track of that chamber, right? And the top arm here is basically, this is where we're actually assessing the function, right? It's assessing the power, assessing the ejection fraction. So it's basically taking the segmentations, the objects that are detected in the bottom layer, right? And then, keeping track of it over time. The specific mechanism for doing this is what we call sort of a spatial temporal convolution. So many of you, if you have worked with images, you might be familiar with sort of convolutional neural networks, which are basically networks that are scanning right, across the two-dimensional image. So the twist here is that we have the, the 2D image, but we also have the third dimension, which corresponds to time. Right? So that's why we have to have a special kinds of convolution that both scans across space it also scans across time. So this is kind of spatial temporal convolution. And the output of the model, right? So it, take, it takes its input as ultrasound that people collect and the output of the model would be an assessment for every beat of the heart, right? So how well is that beat functioning as well as predictions for heart failure as well you know, as several other commonly used metrics. Okay. So the algorithm actually works quite well, right? So uh, we tested on um, data from a different hospital. Uh, so data was trained on Stanford and we tested on patients of different hospitals. And we actually would be able to get quite high accuracies and very similar accuracies uh, around, around 96, 97% in data from entirely different hospital without having to modify or retrain the model. And the model is also quite robust, right? So that's one of the things that you want to check for, for this, especially for these computer vision systems. So here we can show that even if we corrupt up to 50% of the video, right, so we can still actually maintain quite high performance and reliable accuracies. So that's quite critical, especially if you want to apply to video kind of systems and healthcare applications. Uh, we have actually released this whole data set, so that might be something in, of independent interest to the community. So this is currently one of the largest public data sets of medical videos. We released over 10,000 of these ultrasound as well as the phenotypes uh, and labels for annotations for each of these videos. So any of you can, can freely access and play with this data set. And we have also released all of our code. Okay. So hopefully that gives you an example, right, of how we can use these computer vision based systems to sort of mimic human clinical workflow and to do more precise phenotyping. Now I want to discuss how we can apply similar principles and similar kind of algorithms actually to, to uh, now, to look at other more genomic applications. So the next example we want to look at is in histopathology. Right? So that's another example of setting where typically in the current workflow, we're very much relying on human vision to evaluate different biopsy samples. 
So here I have an example of a biopsy sample from breast cancer, right? Uh, and this is what's called an H&E stain image. It's a very commonly used kind of histology image. And an expert clinician would be able to look at this image, right? That takes a long time, but would look at this image, and she would be able to sort of annotate where in this image corresponds to tumor regions and which part of the image corresponds to normal cells. Right? And for this particular image, it's also relatively heterogeneous, where right? you see this mixture of tumor and normal cells. So this is really powerful, um, and it's commonly used in routine you know, clinics. However, it doesn't really give us very much information about the molecular mechanisms, about you know, the genomics from these images. Right? So humans cannot just look at this image and derive genomic information. The parallel workflow that people typically use is to rely on things like single cell analysis, right, where you, get, you have to extract the cells, but you lose typically the spatial information of where these cells come from. And it's also not great because here the critical information is actually the heterogeneity, the spatial information of where, of where these cells are. So we developed a new algorithm, we call it STNet. Um, where we can take this input, this histology image, right? so the routinely generated histology image, and now we can actually directly synthesize and generate spatial profiles for gene expression for many genes, right, on the orders of 100 genes. So here I'm showing you examples, right, taking this input, this patient biopsy sample, and the algorithm, this computer vision based algorithm that we have, is to generate the spatial expression profiles for here for two different genes as examples. And we've actually experimentally validated this, right? So I'll tell you about how we do this experimentally, but here, you know, the, and we can show that the, algorithm, the expression profile that's synthesized by the vision algorithm, just from the histology image itself, right? No annotations, is actually very accurately matches these experimental measurements, which are typically really expensive and time consuming to collect. Okay, and this also works well across different patients. Here's a different sample from another patient. So this, this paper is also very recently published, just earlier this week, and it's really led by uh, Brian He, who's uh, a, a, it's a very ex talented PhD student in my group. Okay, so how does the technology actually work? Right, so this, a lot of this building upon the spatial transformic technology that's developed by my uh, collaborator, Yokon Lundberg. Right, so how this works is that you have a tissue of interest, right, and we have a little chip, and you basically overlay your tissue on top of the chip, Right, and the chip actually has these little probes, which are little dots here on the chip, and each probe will actually have a barcode that will tell you the spatial location of that probe. So when it's overlaid on top of the tissue, it's basically barcoding the transcripts at that location. So that when we do single cell, or when we do just regular sequencing, RNA sequencing, we now have the spatial locations of where each transcript come from. Right, so this is actually a really powerful technology but again, it's hugely expensive, and there are only a few groups in the world that can actually generate this kinds of data. So we worked collaborative with Yocom, so we generated quite a large set of this spatial transcriptomic data sets that are matched to the images, right? Um, and Brian developed this computer vision algorithm that are basically using similar kinds of convolutions that, that, that we shall talk about in the first part, where it's scanning across this large histology image and for each small location, which is around, around 150 microns, it's basically learning an internal representation based on that location. Right? And from that representation, the algorithm is able to synthesize the expression profiles for each of these locations in the image. Right? And we tested this on external patient samples from breast cancer patients, and that actually works quite well. Right? So there's about 100 genes that we can accurately synthesize spatial profiles and these genes include many of the key cancer biomarkers, immune markers, as well as genes that tell something about mobility and architecture. So I think the application of this is especially interesting, right? Um, one application that we're very excited about is use this essentially as kind of an Instagram filter, right? So now we actually have this you know, commonly collected histology images. So instead of having to wait many months to generate the spatial transcriptome profile, we now are able to, in real time, synthesize the spatial genomic profiles for many of the key genes of interest. And this can be used for prognosis and for treatment. And it also tells us something interesting about the cell biology of which genes are linked to spatial architectures. Okay, so the last part, just briefly, I want to tell you about how we can actually put a lot of these pieces together, both the videos and the genomics, to do really for the ambitious feature track morphodynamics of cells and link that to genomics. 
This is work that's led by my student, Michael Wu. So here I'm showing you videos, right, of, uh, of microglia, it's kind of an immune cell in the brain, right? So what Michael's algorithm does is that it first you know, tracks and identifies the individual cells. And here you have two examples of these cells, right? Two examples of microglia. And I mean, they have really interesting, fascinating morphologies and behaviors, right? The top one seems to be interacting maybe with some neuron axons, and the bottom one seems to be spinning very rapidly. So it's, they have fascinating behaviors. And what Michael has is he develops sort of similar kinds of architectures, right, to the one that we showed for the ultrasound of the heart, right, where we can actually take these videos of the, now instead of the heart, we have the individual cells of microglia, and learn, again, learn an internal representation that really captures the morphology of the cells, right. So just very briefly, right, so in this new morphology space that we can learn, so the individual each video of the cell now corresponds to a particular trajectory in this morphology space. Right? So it's kind of a morphodynamic trajectory. And then Hello? James, you're, you're back. Yeah, you're back. Okay, sorry about that. Do you see the screen still? Yeah, we see it, we see it. Okay, okay. so yeah, so, so just the, yeah, so the main point is that now that we have this morphology space, right, um, and we can actually now link that to the genomic space. Right, so here I'm just showing you like this uh, two UMAP visualization right, of the morphology space that we learned just from the videos. So different parts of that space corresponds to different types of cellular behavior. And here in this example from microglia, there are actually two clusters in this space. Right? So you have these blue states, which essentially corresponds to sort of large, lazy microglia cells. Right? And then you have this red cluster that corresponds to much smaller, denser, more active microglia cells. Right, and these states actually correspond to you know, different levels of stimulation, which are really interesting. I won't go into too much detail here. And what we've done in parallel is that we also have single cell RNA sequencing, right? Not, not of the, exactly the same cells, but of very similar types of cells, right? And it's interesting that in the single cell RNA sequencing space, we also have exactly these two types of clusters, right? the blue cluster and the red cluster, and we are able to actually map them to the morphology space. Right, so now that actually gives us a connection between the behaviors, dynamics of the cells, and the expressions and changes in expression across the different behavior states. All right, so this is ongoing work, but hopefully gives you a flavor of the types of things that we can do by integrating computer vision with genomics. Okay, so just to maybe summarize the main messages here, right, so I think there's a lot of really recent advances in computer vision that enable us to do kind of deep phenotyping across the cellular tissue and physiological levels. And integrating that with genomics, I think would be really exciting. Right? And here we have a set of resources that is also available on my website, uh, including all of the code and data that we're happy to share as a resource to the broader community. Okay, so I think, I think I'll stop here and then take any questions. Great, thank you, James. Um, we have, let's see. Um, okay, we have one question that's not really. Um, um, okay, anyone who wants to type in questions, please ask. We have any questions? Oh yeah, okay, Here, here's a question, which is, um, do you think it's possible to integrate any other single cell information such as DNA-seq? Yes, yes, I think that's a, that's a good question. I think we will be able to do that. Yeah, so we are doing this with the single cell RNA-seq, uh, but in principle, uh, there's, we can also try to do the integration with the videos with other, with other modalities. 
Uh, and okay, so uh, would you mind this? This is from Laura Urban. Um, would you mind describing in a bit more detail how the heart ultrasound model distinguishes spatial and temporal variation? Yeah, and yeah then, that's a great question. Yeah. And similarly, can you go into a bit more detail about the spatial transcriptomic example? How does the data differ from slide seek, et cetera? It's kind of similar. Yeah. So yeah, so the spatial, so the, the way to this, the model distinguishes between spatial and temporal variation is because it's treating in the spatial temporal convolutional layers, it's treating the spatial directions differently from the temporal direction, right? So the way to think about this, right, is that if I forget about the temporal direction, I can view this whole video basically as a three-dimensional stack of images, right? So then in that case, then I'll be treating the third stack, the time, the same way as I treat this, the first two stacks, like the spatial information. Uh, and that's not, oftentimes not ideal, right? Because I think there are some particular structures to the third dimension. For example, it's going in a particular direction that's different from these other two spatial directions, right? So the way that's actually done in the model architecture is based on the spatial temporal convolution, which is basically, um, I'm, yeah, so that we can, I have to go into more detail offline, but it's basically, um, you know, doing one kind of convolution on, across space and a different type of convolution spe specifically across time. Right, so there's questions also about you know, other sort of spatial transcriptomics examples. Yeah, so here we, um, so I think similar kinds of technology can also be done for other spatial sequencing methods, right? Uh, so here's a proof of concept. We demonstrate how you can link the, the histology images with the spatial transcriptomic profiles. And the advantage I think of the spatial transcriptomic profiles is that it is able to capture relatively large number of genes, right? On the orders of so several thousand genes. Uh, and it's able to capture them not quite at the single cell resolution, but on the borders of you know, 100 microns, which is still quite good, I think, especially for the kinds of tumor uh, morphology applications that we're interested in. OK, great. Um... Any yes, more? Uh, yeah. I think we're just a few minutes ahead of time. Um, the next talk is in, I guess, in 20 minutes. So we have a short break. Thank, thank you, James, for the great talk. Um, so uh, we'll have Ben and Lisa, or Lisa and Ben, I guess that would be the order, I think, uh, in, in about 20 minutes. So we'll come back then. OK, great. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Lisa, feel free to start. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. I, I, my computer crashed at a really inconvenient time, so I am ready to go. Let me try to get to full screen here. Oh, hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully my internet remains stable. Um, my name is Lisa Basrash, and I'm a, an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And today I'm going to talk about high throughput phenotyping using electronic medical records. Um, but really part of this talk, the beginning part of this talk, is really about some stuff that has been on my mind, and I guess probably on a lot of people's mind, which is, can we learn things from the, from the electronic medical record? And specifically, can we learn things about COVID in this, in this pandemic that's happening? So um, if any of you here are, do EHR phenotyping and have access to medical records, you've probably had one or maybe 20 people come up to you in the last several months and say, could you get all the COVID patients who, have, who are on ACE inhibitors and, and you know, say who are on ACE inhibitors or not at the time they were diagnosed? And I like to pride myself on being a pretty good phenotyper. I've been at this for a long time and um, I, I at least work really hard at it. Um, but it became really clear that, you know, even a simple request like this, um, 
you know, is a pretty complicated problem actually to do in real time and particularly um, with the type of patients who are getting tested with COVID at Vanderbilt. Um, so I have to admit, I'm a little bit disappointed in myself for not being able to um, immediately say, yeah, like that's no problem. That's 101. I can get you everybody who's on ACE inhibitors or who has a history of COPD or type 2 diabetes. Um, but there are some aspects, some natures, uh, some, you know, just some aspects of the, of the electronic health record that make this type of thing really difficult. So just to kind of introduce the topic of high throughput phenotyping, I wanna work through some of the stuff that I've done really recently with a group at Vanderbilt um, on this problem. So I think that um, for people, maybe, maybe this is a straw man, but for people who don't do medical record research and who are looking at this from afar, you know, you would hope that the medical record would look something like this. This is an image that you get in Google if you just search electronic health record. Um, you know, we want the health, electronic health record to be a representation of stuff that's true about patients, to have a real density of data, to have a completeness about it. Um, but that's actually very far from reality. Um, this picture actually, to me, much more represents what the, using the electronic health record is like. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this when it was going around on Twitter probably a year ago, but this is actually a picture that's meant to simulate um, what people who have a stroke in a certain part of their brain experience, where they, every object that they look at looks hauntingly familiar and yet they can't quite name it. It's weird, this picture actually makes me a bit nauseated looking at it at this point. But this is actually a lot like what doing electronic health record research is like. Ev nothing ever quite seems to line up. There are so many holes, inconsistencies, um, and then just piled on redundant data that, um, you know, when you find one patient, you say, this patient has type 2 diabetes. Look, they've been billed for it. It's in their problem list. They're on metformin. But then you'll look through the notes and you'll see patient does not have type 2 diabetes. And you're like, I don't know what I'm looking at anymore. So that's true for a lot of, um, you know, most of the data points that we want to get out of the electronic health record. Really, the EHR is not a great representation of biologically, physically, health-wise, what is going on in the patient. A lot of the information that's in the electronic medical record, not to be too cynical, but is really for billing purposes. It captures it just a snapshot of a patient at certain times. And it really, more than anything else, it captures really the way that a patient traverses through the medical system and not what is going on with them biologically. And I think that you have to be really careful and probably pretty clever to start figuring out how we get biological meaning from the electronic health record. So here's a, a bit of a, not a cautionary tale, because I think, think there's still a lot of, lot of value that you can get with COVID um, looking at EHR data, definitely. And people have done some phenomenal studies so far. Um, but when we looked at the data that we have at Vanderbilt um, in this cohort, which includes everybody who was lab tested for, for coronavirus, we find that actually their data is really sparse. So this is just a density plot of data um, of, of the COVID patients. And this is time zero, what, right when they got the test. I'm gonna move this. Um, so, so you can see there's a lot of density, a lot of physical measurements getting taken. People are gonna weigh, they're getting their temperature taken and stuff like that right when they get the test. They get a bunch of diagnoses right at the at time of test and probably a lot of history of diabetes and things like that, but certainly not complete. And a bunch of lab results. And some of these patients go on to continue to aggregate data after their test, presumably because they're sick either with COVID or something else. Um, but you'll notice here going to the left all the way back, this is pretty sparse. It's not very dense here, right? A lot of the patients we know very little and even a, a sizable fraction, we know nothing about what was going on four months prior to the test because they are new patients to Vanderbilt right when they took the test. Um, so these are, this is a summary that kind of lays this bare. In addition to creating the COVID cohort, we also made a separate cohort as comparison of patients who were tested in 2009 for 19 for influenza during the same time period as our COVID cohort. Um, so you can see here that patients who were tested for influenza, we have like a really great, you know, really nice longitudinal data on these folks. A median of eight, over eight years of records on, on patients who are tested for influenza last year. Patients who were tested for COVID, on the other hand, have um, smaller you know, longitudinal footprint prior to the test. 
And what's even more troubling and such a pain and introduces all kinds of bias is that patients who test positive for COVID actually have a significantly shorter, less longitudinality than patients who test negative. Um, and that's for reasons that you probably can already suss out, but I'll get into in a second. If you look at the number of median number of billing days, and this is sort of a good proxy for the number of times people actually walk through those hospital doors or are staying in an inpatient bed, you'll see that the, the, um, the gap is even um, more exacerbated. You know, with the influenza tested people, we have an average of almost 60, or median of almost 60 visits prior to their influenza test with COVID positive and negative. Again, we just have very few data points. Um, to throw another wrinkle into things, so we have this kind of um, asymmetry. I'll go back here. So we have this asymmetry between people who test positive and negative. Why is that? Well, probably because people who test positive, especially particularly early on in the epidemic, um, Vanderbilt was one of the only places or the only place in the area that was doing COVID testing. So we were taking in a ton of patients who had never hit our medical system before. So we just didn't know anything about them. They did not have an MRN in our, in our database. Um, so a lot of those patients who were symptomatic and came in and got tested just didn't have much retrospective data. Um, and then to add another wrinkle to this whole situation, this is a really a dynamic situation as well, because in early on in the epidemic, we weren't doing much asymptomatic testing, but at this point, um, over 70% of our testing, and this is, this is data from a couple of weeks ago, um, is for asymptomatic patients. So those are patients who are in the emergency room, who are getting surgery, et cetera. Everybody who walks through the door of Vanderbilt is getting a test for COVID at this point. And so that again changes the um, ascertainment reason for getting the test in the first place, which, which also is reflected on how much data we have um, previously on these patients. So what we found when, and it's probably not surprising after I showed you this data, what we found when we tried to apply our standard issue ways that we do phenotyping um, in the EHR, um, we found that they, those methods did not perform particularly well on this, on this cohort. Um, really in large part because of the lack of, of density that, you know, typically when we're running studies, we'll create a cohort, you know, we have a lot of patients, we get to choose the ones that have a lot of longitudinality and have certain characteristics and use these algorithms. Um, in this case, we wanted to look at everybody who was tested for COVID and we just had, didn't have the density. Um, and so you can see for a number of comorbidities that people are interested in with COVID, um, chosen not completely at randomly, but, you know, kind of ones that have been mentioned a lot, um, that fee codes, which is a method for phenotyping I'll talk about in a minute. And um, the other column here is an EHR vendor. Actually, I'll just say it's EPICS um, algorithms that they put out to do phenotyping um, that you guys may, may be familiar with if you're, if you're part of this field that EPIC has put out these queries that use like billing codes and, and, and SNOMED terms and things like that to get COVID related um, comorbidities and outcomes and stuff. Um, so in both of these cases, you see that the performance is sort of lackluster. Um, I mean, COPD, I guess it looks, oh, no, the PPP doesn't look that great. Anyway, so the, the, the performance here is, is not that great. And it's not what we would necessarily expect from these algorithms. But again, it, it really comes down to data density. But the real fun starts when you try to just naively use this data to start doing correlation analyses. And so I wanted to, um, we're putting together a manuscript, sort of a meta manuscript about ways that you might deal with, um, you know, missingness and bias and stuff when you're doing COVID research based on our experiences with this cohort, um, which I guess I should pause and say, you know, we're making this register because we do see the value in this data and there are people who are utilizing this data and doing really cool studies. Um, so just less do you think that I'm trying to say that this is actually totally worthless. I don't think it's worthless at all. I just think you have to think really carefully before you start diving in and, and doing, um, doing studies with this stuff. Um, so, but here's something that you shouldn't do, um, which is just, let's say you wanted to say, what is a risk factor for testing positive for COVID as opposed to testing negative? And you take all the comorbidities you ascertain with their data before the test. Well, even if you control for number of visits and then gender and age and all this stuff, what you find is a ton of significant associations. So this is a FIWAS plot, which is sort of like the phenotype correlate to a GWAS plot. And that red line right there, that's the Bonferroni correction. So you can see there's a whole bunch of phenotypes that are associated with testing positive, right? And these little arrows, barely perceptible, but they're there, they're pointing down. That means all these things are protective for testing positive for COVID. 
So because those labels were unreadable and it didn't take the time to, <laughs> um, to label, label them correctly, because it really is a terrible study, I'll just show you here what was protective of testing positive. The first thing was tobacco use disorder. This was an association I saw really early on and I was like, I just don't even know what to say anymore, right? That smoking is protective of testing positive for COVID. Um, probably many of you have heard that this is something that a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of my friends at different institutions who've observed this association as well. Perhaps it's real. I mean, who's to say, right? Perhaps, maybe smoking does protect you from being COVID positive. But if you look at that association in the context with all this other stuff, you realize that, you know, there's a lot going on with this data that is not being dealt with. For instance, why is bariatric surgery, why is getting bariatric surgery protective of COVID? Um, why is getting chemotherapy protective of getting COVID? Um, and chemotherapy in particular is pretty clear that that association is there because we are testing all patients who are cancer patients at this point. So that really comes down to um, the fact that people with chemo are getting asymptomatic screens. But essentially, this is just a whole big bag of correlations that you shouldn't believe. There's certainly not anything biological. This is much more about the type of patient who's coming in to get, to get COVID testing and the probability that they're going to get a positive test. Um, if you just look at patients who are, were screened asymptomatically, the plot looks a lot more tame. Gone are all the protective associations, including smoking, right? And you're just left with a couple of things that cross the Bonferroni correction including viral infection. So if you had a past viral infection, you're more likely to be COVID positive on an asymptomatic screen. And um, other disorders, I can read this right, other dis diseases of the respiratory syndrome system. These are really inspiring associations. Um, you know, maybe there is something biological here, um, but you know, I guess these aren't necessarily the most ex may exciting, um, exciting findings in, in the study. And, and I didn't do this to, to say anything new about COVID. My point that I wanna make is that this is probably the thing I say the most as a, as a data scientist is if you're not careful about how you set up your study, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. And that's an example of what we see um, with the results there. Um, but, you know, I do think that there's a ton of value to doing EHR research. And typically, actually, I start my talk with all the awesome things you can do with EHR data and not talk about all of the flaws and detriments and pitfalls and, and things you probably shouldn't try. Um, and so it's really just been this COVID experience and, and trying to do research on this data that has brought to fore, I think, some of the, the real challenges that still exist in the field. Um, but I want to sort of pivot and talk a little bit about just kind of back up and get a little bit historical. This is, for, this is a study from seven years ago um, and talk a little bit about how EHR phenotyping is done for those of you who, who don't do this um, for your day to day. So um, I, I work as I'm part of a large group called eMERGE, which does a lot of EHR phenotyping um, for the purposes of doing genetic studies. It's a whole bunch of institutions that share EHR data and genetic data. Um, it's an awesome group. I've learned a ton by, by taking part in their studies. Um, and they've really set the bar and really set some standards in terms of how to do EHR phenotyping. And I've been privileged to be kind of along for the ride. Um, so one strategy or one way that you can get phenotypes out of the EHR, sort of like the classical approach, is to basically get a, you know, you have your goal phenotype. In this case, it's hypothyroidism. And then you talk to a bunch of clinicians and you say, hypothyroidism, what's going to be in the record? And then they'll say, okay, they're going to be billed for hypothyroidism in their records. They're going to have an abnormal TSH. Um, they're going to have, be on levothyroxine, for instance, and you write all this down and you think, okay, these are my inclusion criteria. And then there's going to be a bunch of other things like, you know, we don't want to have people who had their thyroid ablated, so we're going to get rid of all the secondary, um, you know, ablation cases. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to include people who are pregnant because people who are pregnant, their thyroid gets really weird. We don't want anybody with multiple endocrine neoplasms. So these are all exclusion criteria. But basically, you come up with an in principle definition of what you think, um, what you think that uh, hypothyroidism is going to look like in the medical record. Um, and this method is tedious. You know, when I get, you know, when things like this come across my desk, I'm like, oh, think of all the data elements, right? 
you got to do a little bit of light NLP, getting stuff out of the problem list. You got to use billing codes. You got to use CPT codes. You got to get medications, which are like an unremitting nightmare. Medi medications are horrible to deal with, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is that this type of approach where you get expert opinions and you come up with a, an algorithm and then you check it against a gold standard and iterate really does work. And the reason we know it works is that when we, when we run algorithms like this um, on genetic data, we find associations. Um, I should have created a plot actually. So most phenotypes that you ascertain and all phenotypes that you ascertain poorly, if you're not doing something crazy and you run a GWAS, you're not gonna find anything that crosses Bonferroni. You know, and that's a really nice property. And that is a property of genetics that actually stands apart from all the other elements that you can get inside the medical record. You know, if you take, if you take everybody who's had an abnormal, let's say have had high LDL, and you say, what else is that correlated with? It's correlated with almost everything. Just like testing positive or negative from COVID is correlated with a whole ton of stuff, right? Not biological, but just correlated, right? Genetics has this nice property of sort of, one, being there from the beginning, we're talking germline, right? And two, um, being, it's not actually known by the clinician and it's not known by the patient primarily for the most part. And so it doesn't bias what doctors test for. It doesn't bias what patients go in for. So it's got this nice property. If you make phenotypes like this, which are available at this website called PKB, which are these eMERGE network phenotypes, they do work very well under kind of normal conditions um, and you were able to make, do genetic discovery. So in this study, we actually found an association with something called FOXY1 um, or a, a variant near this gene called FOXY1, which has since been replicated many times and is definitely a loci that's associated with hypothyroidism. Um, but one thing that we noticed as we were doing a lot of these um, algorithms and something that um, the PI was working for, Josh Denny, uh, really latched onto was that a common element of these complicated algorithms was that all of them included ICD billing codes as sort of a backbone, as sort of the most essential element is that, you know, if somebody has hypothyroidism, we're going to say they have to be billed for hypothyroidism. Um, so building on that observation, um, you know, Josh had this idea that like, maybe we could just do this in a high throughput way. Why don't we, you know, accept the fact that we're gonna take some sort of hit in our performance, but gain sort of breadth by just grouping ICD codes together once in an Excel spreadsheet basically, and mapping groups of these fee codes or groups of these ICD codes into something we call fee was codes and now we call them fee codes. Um, so you can see here a couple of examples, like these are ICD-9 codes, which are billing codes in the EHR that are all mapped to the concept of ulcerative colitis. Um, and so uh, we, we put this map together and developed a method called FIWAST, which allows you to scan at a certain genetic loci all the phenotypic correlates um, of, you know, for that one loci. Um, and we also create exclusion criteria that are, that are attached to the fee codes as well that use fee codes. So if you're running a study on hypothyroidism, for instance, you, you exclude everybody who's had a goiter, for instance. Um, so when we had that association with that FOXC1 variant and hypothyroidism, we used fee codes actually to try to see if there were other associations, if there was like essentially pleiotropy, if this loci had a pleiotropic property and, and was associated with other stuff. And um, we did find other th thyroid dysfunction that was independently associated at that low side. Uh, we also found a non-statistically significant, but kind of trending there, association with atrial, atrial flutter, which we later um, did a little bit more work on and has an interesting story itself. Um, but what I didn't realize at the time, when, and I didn't realize until years later, actually, when I was putting a talk together and digging around in the supplement of this paper, was that when we did this FIWAS, we inadvertently ran an experiment. And that experiment was to test whether using fee codes, which I should have mentioned, when we do, when you define cases with fee codes, we typically require that people are billed on two different dates, which really cuts down on the, on the noise that these billing codes have. So we did, a, essentially we ran the experiment of, you know, how well does using two or more fee codes, basically billing codes, work versus this super complicated algorithm. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that it performs very well. So if you use the super complicated algorithm, your odds ratio is 0.74. If you use the fee codes, your odds ratio is 0.76, real close. And actually your p-value is a lot 
more significant, probably because that super complicated algorithm was a little bit too aggressive in excluding um, patients um, for various reasons, at least vis-a-vis -vis this particular variant. Um, so this is uh, something that now that I, um, I noticed it, I present all the time because I think it communicates something that's really important and fundamental about doing EHR research. And that is that given the missingness, the bias, and all the, all the complexity of, of EHR data, it's very hard to, in principle, assess what is going to work in practice. In some ways, uh, it's like starting with something like this where you're like, two or more fee codes, it's okay, but it could be helped. But then you end up with something like this, which is not the direction you wanted to go. Um, actually, that maybe I should stop using this slide because there's a bit of a diss on the eMERGE algorithm, which is perfectly fine. But anyhow, I think you get the point. Um, so kind of referring back to this theme of like how stressed out I felt about using COVID data and how much bias there was and how it was kind of freaking me out. Um, it made me recognize how much I love doing genetics with EHR because genetics can be so grounding. And it's grounding in the sense that when you have genetic data linked to EHR data, you can replicate known stuff. And when you replicate known stuff, it like puts, it like puts ground under your feet or like anchors you. It makes you um, recognize where things work and, and maybe be, even be able to assess where things don't work. And so I'm going to end with a little bit of... Uh, um, ode to my favorite thing in science, which is replication, and talk about how, um, for those of you who are doing stuff like this, talk about a tool that I'm, I am putting out really, really soon um, to help, um, that might be able to help you out. Okay, so one of the studies that we did early on with fee codes was actually this big replication study where we got all these phenotypes that are ascertained using ICD codes in a high throughput way. And we asked how many of them can we replicate with, um, sorry, these, these associations came from the GWAS catalog. I'm probably a presuming a lot of familiarity with some of this stuff, so I do apologize. Uh, GWAS catalogs, this big catalog of like every GWAS that was ever run and, has, and in, was published and it's now enormous, right? Um, in 2013, it was quite a bit smaller, um, although I think that was probably like peak GWAS at the time. Um, and we tried to replicate all those associations in the catalog using this high throughput method. And what we found, oh, I never like, I didn't mean to leave these p-values in there because I think they're kind of meaningless, but basically what we found is that for, a, for phenotype SNP pairs that we were powered to replicate, we replicated about 66% of them, which by chance, you know, you're gonna replicate 5% of them. So definitely enriched. And one thing that was really encouraging is that we replicated associations from a very wide variety of phenotypes, you know, from atrial fibrillation to morbid obesity to prostate cancer. Um, so what this demonstrated is that those fee codes really do contain some biological information about what's going on in the patient, despite the fact that it's fairly, fairly low resolution, they're billing codes, and it's extracted from this document that has all the biases that I just went on about ad nauseum. Um, so I'll just finish up with a tool. This is just basically a, a screenshot of the Excel spreadsheet I've been working on. But basically, to do that study, what we needed was a map with fee code, SNP, and then whether we were powered to find the study. Basically, we used the odds ratio from the, ca from the catalog to, to, to do a power analysis. Um, we never released um, that map in a sort of formal way as a tool. And so seven years later, I realized that it really needs to just get out there. So it is, this is a map that's coming really soon and it's gonna be on fewaskcatalog.org, which is a website that we have that has a lot of um, FIWAS related tools, including the fee, fee code maps themselves. And the idea behind this reference map, which I feel really excited about, it's sort of like the same thing as like, when you get do, you know, like chip data, to do a GWAS, the first thing that you do is assume it's garbage, right? You assume that something went horribly wrong and that you have to then prove to yourself that it's okay. And so what are some of the ways that you do it? One of the ways you do it is you can use like a reference genome from like thousand genomes and you say, okay, my sample is like um, a European ancestry sample. I'm gonna take, you know, I'm gonna compare the minor low frequencies of this other sample and see if it lines up nice on the diagonal. And probably if you've been doing this long enough, it's definitely happened to me, you'll do this once and like you'll get a plot that's like all black, right? Just with dots and you're like something went terribly wrong, right? So what I, I wanna put out in this paper is basically a phenotype reference map. And so it's a map of fee codes and SNPs 
that you should find is you know, associated in your data set. So if you happen to be lucky enough to get SNP data linked to EHR data, you can run these association tests and then calculate your replication rate. And um, because of the nature of GWAS results, these are ancestry specific. And one note that I wanted to make because it just really struck me when I made this table this morning is that we really need to do more associations on non-European populations. The size of the European phenotype reference map is, you know, 6,700 odd um, rows. The African um, reference map is 261 associations. And that is just really a reflection of, of stuff that people have written very eloquently about um, the just abundance of research that's been done on European populations. Um, and the lack thereof in, in non-European populations. So with that, I will end my talk and I'm not sure if we wanna do questions, but I'll thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lisa. There's, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A. Uh, can you see them? Yeah, okay. I wonder where other scientists can get open access detailed COVID-19 medical records. That is such a struggle. I'm not, I'm, that's, that's beyond my pay grade to figure out who shares what, but naturally people are pretty protective of their data and they're also at laws that make it difficult to share data and make it very open. Um, but so I'm not aware of any fully open resource. Um, there are a number, a, a huge number of consortium that are, consortia that are coming together and aggregating this data. Um, but in terms of role level data, I don't know of any that are publicly available. Oh, and then just somebody said something nice. That's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, and not a question, but a comment. Oh, wait, hold on. Am I? Oh, no. And nothing dismissed. No, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, next speaker is Ben Rafael. Uh, yeah, he's there. Ben. Can you try to share your screen and then? Yes, here I am. Let's see if I can share right. my screen. Go can you it. see me? So I'm, um, I guess I introduce myself. I'm uh, Ben Raphael from Princeton University, um, but I'm coming to you today live from the Hollywood Bowl, as you can see, uh, in honor of CGSI. Uh, as you heard at the beginning, um, part of CGSI is community building. And one of the great uh, events that always happens is our evening at the Hollywood Bowl, which I'm very sad to be missing this year, as I'm sure we all are. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to come to CGSI, please do apply uh, for next year. Uh, so let me now see if the screen sharing works. There we are. All right, do we have the slides? Yes. Perfect, okay, so um, today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about some of our work on single cell cancer genomics. And just to set the stage, um, I remind you that cancer is driven largely by somatic mutations that accumulate during the lifetime of an individual. And so when we sequence a, a tumor at the present day, we're observing the result of this evolutionary process. And uh, we often get a, a tumor that's a mixture of normal cells and, and you know, multiple populations of, of tumor cells, which might have uh, different groups of somatic mutations. And these subpopulations are sometimes referred to as clones. So uh, characterizing kind of the heterogeneity within a tumor, as well as trying to quantify this evolutionary process, uh, has many important uh, applications, uh, clinical applications, in terms of you know, finding what might be the, the drivers of, of, of development of cancer in a particular patient and, and the, the um, mutations that might be responsible for uh, response or resistance to treatment. Um, we can also understand perhaps some of the more um, basic principles of, of how cancer evolves and, and how it might, uh, say, spread between different uh, anatomical sites in, 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 in metastasis uh, and, and, and numerous other sort of applications. So in order to do this, um, again, by way of reminder, it's sort of remind you that, that muta somatic mutations that, that uh, cause cancer or that accumulate in cancer cells you know, range across all genomic scales from single nucleotide mutations uh, through larger copy number changes, chromosomal rearrangements, all the way through whole genome uh, duplications. And 
over the decades, our sort of understanding of cancer has been driven in a large part by the different technologies we've had to measure these mutations across these scales. So going back several decades, uh, the cytogenetic techniques allowed us to measure um, large scale chromosome rearrangements um, in, in individual cells. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest in quantifying um, these, these rearrangements, identifying translocations and fusion genes that were important for driving cancer in a number of different tumor types. Uh, in, in the early 2000s, uh, microarray-based techniques um, allowed us to identify copy number aberrations at a much higher resolution than we were able to with, with uh, uh, cytogenetic techniques. And so a number of duplications and deletions that were important in driving cancer development were, were discovered. Um, but these uh, uh, arrays you know, required a lot of DNA. You couldn't do them with single cells. And so these measurements were done uh, with bulk tumors. So we're really measuring kind of the superposition of, of copy number changes in in a bulk tumor. Um, then, of course, with the DNA sequencing, um, you know, first was sort of targeted or whole exome sequencing. We're able to uh, reliably identify single nucleotide mutations and in small indels, again, in, in bulk tumors. Uh, and then, you know, in the past uh, several years, switching to whole genome sequencing, which allow us to uh, really uh, measure um, uh, mutations across all of these scales, but again, in, in the setting of, of bulk tumors. And in the past couple of years, uh, the technologies have shifted just to the sort of right-hand part of the slide here. And um, there are now um, technologies for doing targeted or whole exome sequencing in single cells uh, and, and, and groups of, of single cells in a high throughput way. And in the past few years for looking at a uh, whole genome sequence of single cells and, and groups of cells from, from tumors. Now, you know, every one of these technologies has, has limitations. And so, you know, they sort of skew our view if we're look, using one technology as to what the important mutations might, might be in a tumor. And so like the, you know, drunk looking for uh, his key, you know, underneath the light of the lamppost, um, you know, it, it may be hard to sort of see where, where the key is if it's not underneath the light. So the technology only sort of gives us a, a limited view of, of what we can measure. And what we hope to do in, in, in our group, and of course many other groups that work in, in computational uh, cancer biology is, is to sort of uh, try to develop algorithms that allow us to, to sort of make um, better use of the technologies and, and identify you know, different signals that might not be readily apparent from um, the, the technology of interest. So that's sort of the stage that I wanna set to tell you about um, a few of the things we've been doing recently in the group and developing algorithms for sort of two more recent sequencing technologies. One, uh, ultra low coverage, whole genome, single cell sequencing, and the other, um, spatial transcriptomics, which we heard a, a bit about from James's talk um, uh, at, the, at the start of the session. So, you know, I guess uh, I, should, I should say, you know, a, a warning, you know, you shouldn't go and, and climb lampposts, you know, unless uh, you're an expert, right? So don't attempt this, this sort of picture on, on your own. And uh, similarly, a warning that everything I'm gonna show you is sort of, you know, using the technologies in a way that maybe they were not ideally designed for. So we're really trying to squeeze extra signal out of these technologies. So starting with um, the whole genome sequencing, and this is a, a technology that's um, uh, been, been around for a couple of years, but um, really was just recently uh, commercialized um, in, in a high throughput way um, by 10X Genomics um, and adapting their technology for you know, barcoding single cells um, and followed by doing you know, sequencing in parallel. Many of you are probably familiar with this technology for, for its applications to single cell RNA-seq or, or uh, ATT-seq. Uh, similar idea here, except we're, we're um, measuring DNA from, from these single cells. Um, and, and the trade-off is what we get is extremely low coverage, about 0.03x coverage uh, per single cell, uh, and from you know, maybe approximately 2,000 cells. Um, so you know, what could we do with such low coverage per cell? Uh, measuring single nucleotide mutations doesn't seem like a, a very useful application. Um, however, we could hope to identify larger copy number aberrations from um, this low coverage DNA sequencing. And that's exactly what uh, 10X Genomics uh, and, and other similar technologies uh, were, were developed uh, for this application in mind. So we align the reads, the barcoded reads that we get from each individual uh, cell, we align them to, to the reference genome. We then can 
um, uh, look at the, the number of reads that align to each position of the genome, um, segment that into sort of a more uh, 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 continuous signal on where we see um, increases in this read depth. That's sort of some indication that there's been uh, a duplication of that part of the genome. And when we see decreases in this read depth, that's sort of an indication that there's been a deletion of that part of the genome in each individual cell. So we can get this sort of nice uh, matrix here after some analysis that tells us, you know, across each cell, so each row of this matrix is, is an individual cell, uh, and, and, and the columns uh, are the positions in the genome, and you can see this plot that sort of indicates some indication of the number of copies of each region of, of uh, the, the, the genome in each of the individual cells. So <clears throat> these methods infer what's called total copy number. So they're telling us in each region the number of of copies that uh, is present in that region in that cell. And the um, 10X genomics application note that sort of showed this uh, sort of proof of principle of their technology um, did an experiment where they uh, took five sections, five little pieces of a breast tumor here shown on the left. For each section, they um, did uh, the single cell um, uh, sequencing and they obtained sort of a, a copy number profile measure so it looks like this. Again, the colors there indicate the number of copies of each region. And so um, what you can see, of course, is that this region on top here, uh, this first few rows, those are some normal cells that are all in, in, in two copies across most of their genome. And then uh, the, the subsequent rows are, are tumor cells. And you can see that not all tumor cells have the same copy number aberrations. So this is a beautiful picture and a great illustration of how we can measure now copy number in thousands of individual cells in parallel. But there's really something um, important that's, that's missing in this analysis. And that's that the genome, the human genome, as we know, is, is diploid. So every time there's a copy number change, a duplication or deletion, it happens on one of the two homologous chromosomes. So rather than infer a total copy number of three, as shown in this example, it would be much more informative if we knew that you know, it was two copies of, say, the maternal allele and one copy of the, of the paternal chromosome. So we'd like to get this allele specific copy number information. And there's many reasons for this. One of the most useful actually is that it's um, widely known in cancer that there are uh, copy number changes that um, are actually copy neutral. So what you have is uh, a, a loss of, of one uh, allele followed by a gain of the other. So that the total copy number stays the same in this example, the total copy of both re, uh, of, uh, is two, but um, what's happened is there's been a, a loss of one allele and a gain of the other. So this is a, a type of event that is invisible to total copy number analysis. And for also for identifying and distinguishing these whole genome duplications, um, having allele specific information turns out to be uh, very useful. So this has uh, been known for, for a while and, and in the bulk tumor setting, there are many great techniques that have been developed to uh, identify and obtain allele-specific copy number information. And what they do is they look at a second signal. They look not only at the read depth uh, along the genome, but they also look at what's called the B allele frequency. And the B allele frequency is to look at a, germ, a germline SNP. And that germline SNP, if it's heterozygous, there's, we would expect in a diploid region, a normal region of the genome, that there'd be one uh, copy of each allele, the maternal and the paternal allele. Uh, and every time there's a gain or loss of one of those copies, that, that ratio of the two alleles will change. So we'll see a shift in the B allele away from 0 0.5. And so we can see along this B allele frequency plot, these shifts in, in uh, the B allele. And so by putting these two pieces of information together computationally, one can obtain these allele specific copy number profiles. So wouldn't it be great to do the same thing on uh, the single cell sequencing data? Uh, unfortunately, we quickly run into a problem. Um, there's very low coverage per cell, so the read depth signal becomes very noisy, but still something we might be able to uh, uh, use, especially at sort of the larger uh, uh, range, uh, chromosomal range or multi-megabase range. However, the B allele frequency uh, signal completely disappears. And that's because in any given cell, if we're sequencing a cell at 0.03x coverage, most of the germline SNPs are not gonna be covered at all. And you know, if only if we're really lucky, will we get copies of both uh, alleles at that single nucleotide location. So um, the B allele frequency, if we look at it naively, just sort of looks like, for the most part, zero or one at almost every single location along the genome. 
Now, we can't just sort of try to pool this signal across adjacent SNPs because we don't know the, the phasing of these SNPs. If we look at two uh, adjacent SNPs, we don't know a priori whether they're on the same uh, homologous chromosome or on different chromosomes. So what we developed uh, recently is a method uh, that we call CHISEL. This is work by um, my postdoc, Simone Zacharia. This will come out of Nature Biotechnology uh, soon. And, and this is what we think is the first method to uh, infer allele-specific copy numbers from this ultra-low coverage whole genome sequencing data. Uh, and there's a whole series of steps here, and I'm not going to really go through all of them. I'll just show you kind of two of the key ideas here and then show you an application to um, breast cancer. So the first key idea is to actually try to recover this B allele frequency signal. And the way we do this is to make use of the, the um, techniques that have been developed in the genetics community to actually do haplotype phasing. Uh, and in particular, what we can do is take these uh, germline SNPs and use reference-based phasing algorithms that developed in the past few years. I've learned about some of these algorithms from Brian Browning's talk at CG CGSI over the years. Uh, and we can use um, you know, large populations of, of uh, human individuals to uh, get uh, reference-based uh, phasing. This gives us haplotype blocks in the order of a few megabases. And then from those haplotype blocks, we can start to recover some of this B allele frequency signal. There's, there's a few other tricks we have to do in order to kind of make sure we're not, you know, getting switching between haplotype blocks uh, frequently across, across the cells, and that's described in the paper. Um, even with this B allele frequency signal and the read depth signal that we have, they're still extremely noisy. And looking at one single cell, it's very difficult to identify the, the copy number profile, the allele-specific copy number. So the second um, thing we do is we actually make use of the fact that the cells uh, in a tumor are related. And so we um, look for um, global clustering of these read depth and B allele frequency signals across the whole genome and across all cells. So you know, each of these uh, plots right here, each point here in these 2D plots is giving uh, for a specific region of the genome, a specific bin, the B allele frequency, and the read depth in one cell. We sort of stack up these plots and cluster them, and we can identify uh, the, these copy number states. This is sort of building on some work that uh, Simona had also done to try to do this global clustering for bulk samples. And this is a related algorithm called Hatchet, uh, which is uh, on the bioarchive and also will be published uh, soon. So just to sort of show you a few examples of what we, what we can obtain. So applying it to the same um, breast cancer tumor, um, we were able to identify uh, previously uncharacterized allele-specific copy number aberrations. So on the top here is a, a version of this total copy number plot that I, that I showed you before. Uh, the first few rows indicating normal cells with copy number two, and then these tumor cells with different copy number changes across the genome. The bottom is the allele-specific version inferred by chisel. We see, again, the normal cells on top. But what we can also see is that some chromosomes, like chromosome 13 or chromosome 10, which had a total copy number of two, now in the allele-specific version have a copy, allele-specific copy number of two zero, indicating one of these copy-neutral loss of heterozygosities. Uh, and in fact, we find uh, several of these uh, across the genome. And it turns out that in this tumor, um, many of these copy neutral loss of heterozygosity events occur in regions that contain known tumor suppressor genes like P10 or ARID1B or RB1. And so these would have looked like regions of normal copy number if we had not done the allele specific copy number analysis. Um, in addition to, there's another example of a copy neutral, uh, sorry, not copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, but uh, uh, two different um, uh, regions that both have total copy number four. However, in the allele specific version, one of them is 3 1, the other one is 2 2, sort of the balanced. And these actually distinguish two different groups of cells or clones uh, in this tumor. So we can then, once we sort of know this information, we can then go sort of validate it in a way by pooling the information from all the cells uh, that, that uh, are grouped together in clone three here and obtain this composite read depth and B allele frequency signal. And we see very clearly in doing that, although the uh, signal in one cell is, is very uh, noisy, when we group them together, we see a clear shift on top in this B allele frequency away from uh, one half, whereas in the 2 2 case, where the two copy numbers are balanced, we see a B allele frequency uh, that's approximately one half. 
So we can do a lot more. Um, there's, we can identify these haplotype specific copy numbers um, and, and I won't talk about that. Uh, I'll just show you kind of putting all this information together across all uh, five tumor sections. And then we do this, we can actually get sort of a complete uh, reconstruction in copy number space of the evolution of this tumor. Uh, and so we have this tree here, which shows on the bottom and the leaves, the, the eight clones that were identified and the cells that uh, number of cells that are in each clone. And on the branches of this tree are indicated various copy number events that distinguish um, uh, the, the groups of cells below them. You'll see actually that there's some interesting things where uh, parts of uh, chromosome two labeled B uh, and A, those are different allele specific and in this case haplotype specific events. Um, but we see other things. We see actually evidence that this tumor had a whole genome duplication and that we can actually separately distinguish copy number of uh, changes that occurred before and after the whole genome duplication. We see that P53 um, inactivation seems to occur before the whole genome duplication. Uh, and we can also find examples of um, what are called mirrored subclonal events. So where there's um, the, the same uh, 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 event that's occurring twice. Here, I guess it's on chromosome two. We can see different, uh, sorry, chromosome three. We can see chromosome three, uh, allele A being deleted twice independently on two different branches of, of this tree. And this is uh, uh, types of events have been seen in other tumor types as well. We can get further validation for this tree by actually taking single nucleotide mutations, which we can't uh, identify very reliably in individual cells, but we can actually group cells together once we know that they're on, on, on this tree. And we can ask how many somatic uh, single nucleotide mutations would support this particular branch of the tree, meaning the branch that separates the cells on the left from the cells on the right. And we see that there are 3,400 mutations that support that branch, and this is significant under a permutation test. So, you know, there's a lot more of, of the analysis uh, in, in the paper, um, but what we're able to do here is really for the first time, we think, get allele and haplotype specific information, copy number information from uh, the, this low coverage whole genome duplication, uh, uh, low coverage whole genome sequencing. So, um, having done that, we, we sort of um, wanted to go a little bit further and ask how far could we push the information that we could um, uh, obtain from, from this low coverage whole genome sequencing. And in particular, we know that copy number aberrations don't uh, distinguish um, certain clones, or they may not distinguish certain clones. So here in this, this uh, cartoon, you see clone one and two here uh, have exactly the same copy number profiles, but there are single nucleotide mutations that distinguish these two clones. So could we uh, identify um, single nucleotide mutations from this low coverage data? So in general, um, it's very challenging to reliably identify single nucleotide mutations from um, all types of, of uh, uh, single cell sequencing data because uh, of the you know, extremely low uh, signal you obtain. There's only one you know, uh, uh, DNA molecule per cell. And so often there needs to be some amplification that happens uh, to, to, to get sufficient signal to sequence. And this leads to problems with um, uh, you know, false positives and false negatives and allele dropout that all lead to sort of a, a incomplete uh, measurement of um, mutations in, 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 in the tumor. So if you think of this mutation matrix here, it should be a zero one value matrix who indicates whether somatic mutation is present or not in each cell. And we see that there's many missing entries as well as false positives and false negatives. So it's been a very active area uh, recently to try to um, get a better analysis of single nucleotide mutations from, from single cell sequencing data, including in the recom community, where a number of the papers that are listed below were, were sort of published. And what these methods sort of do in, 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 you know, in, in, in general is they try to sort of look across um, cells and across mutations and really do sort of fancy versions of clustering, you know, cluster mutations across cells or cluster, you know, cells with similar mutation profile. So again, using the fact that the cells within the tumor are, you know, from a shared evolutionary process. And so, you know, they're, they're related. So could we take, you know, some of those existing algorithms and use them on this really ultra low coverage um, single cell sequencing data. And this was sort of the, the, the challenge. We wanted to see if, if there was anything that, that could be done here. And what the one first notices is that the sparsity in this um, ultra low coverage data is just way above anything that's ever been analyzed by um, these, these other uh, algorithms, which are really focused on kind of targeted single cell sequencing data. So the mutation matrices we're obtaining have something like you know, up to 99% uh, missing entries. 
sort of shown in other way, um, you know, the sort of number of entries in our matrix is, is large because we have many, many cells, um, but the, the sparsity is really high. So you know, the existing algorithms are all operating in this regime of having, you know, uh, uh, less sparse matrices, but, you know, with fewer cells and we're sort of up here. And, and so if you take this type of data and you run it with any of these existing algorithms, you get hardly anything. There's just really no signal that these algorithms can pick up on. And so what we uh, just tried to do is see if we could develop an algorithm that would, that would you know, do something in this ultra sparse uh, setting. And uh, my PhD student, Matt Myers, and, and working with Simone Zacharia, um, sort of came up with the idea that, you know, although this matrix is extremely sparse, um, because they're, you know, the cells again are related, there should be some block structure that's apparent in this matrix, although it's an extremely sparse block structure. So could we de develop an approach to identify this sparsity, this sparse block structure? This turns out to be very similar to problems that have been dealt with in uh, the social networking uh, uh, community that analyzes social networks, um, where again, they look for these sort of groups of uh, individuals, you know, that, that are friends and in really large networks and the connections are very sparse. And one of the models that's used there is what's called the stochastic block model. Uh, here we have what is an example of it's really called the bipartite stochastic block model. Um, so we get a block matrix. If you think of this matrix as the bi-adjacency matrix of a bipartite graph, then what we're looking for are, you know, sort of simultaneous clustering of, of mutations and, and cells. So, um, what these, this block model describes is really um, probabilities of ones is a generative model that describes, you know, a, 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 it's parameterized by a block probability matrix that whose entries describe the probability of there being a one in each of the blocks of, of the matrix. And they're actually quite sophisticated and, and in fact, um, efficient and scalable methods that have been developed to actually try to infer this block probability matrix from these really sparse matrices. And we, we applied a, a one of these and remarkably, uh, it worked uh, just surprisingly well. Um, and with really sparse data was able to recover um, the block matrices that we simulated. Um, so this block probability here on, on the x-axis and when you can see these other algorithms, there's not much signal at all. Um, and this SBM clone um, starts in a regime where there's not much signal, but once this block probability, the sort of density of ones gets high enough, there's enough signal to, to recover. So um, we wanted to see this would work on, on the real data. Um, we we um, first did sort of a, a simulation guided by the, the clone sizes that we had estimated from the copy number analysis and the mutations uh, within them. So um, we, we built a, a simulated block matrix using the block probabilities inferred from, from the tree. Uh, and, and what we found is, um, you know, that of course it's a, a very sparse matrix um, as indicated here by these block probabilities. What we found was, you know, unfortunately the matrix is a little too sparse to infer with uh, the, the current uh, sequencing depth. But if the sequencing depth was just a little bit higher, um, there's enough signal that we were able to recover the clonal structure. So the way we sort of did this is that we merged together some cells. And if we merged together eight cells, and cells that we knew were from either the left or right branches of this tree, then suddenly using only single nucleotide mutations, we could recover the branches of left and right between these cells. Um, so that's, that's sort of nice, but you know, unfortunately it doesn't quite, um, we had to use this information about copy number aberrations, but there is another uh, technique for doing single cell sequencing uh, whole genome called dot PCR. Um, tends to be not as high throughput in terms of the number of cells you can, you can analyze, but um, you get uh, about tenfold higher coverage per cell. And in fact, from this dot PCR data, we can just directly from single cell, single nucleotide mutations alone, no copy number aberrations, in fact, uh, identify uh, groups of cells or clones um, that uh, uh, pretty robustly. And what we found in analyzing the, the data set that was shown uh, uh, that, that was for this dot PCR was that um, they had it sequenced pre and post treatment samples uh, of, of a, a breast tumor. And what we were able to see is actually in post treatment, there were actually some remaining tumor cells, which had sort of been missed in the previous analysis, which was looking only at copy number changes. However, when we look at single nucleotide mutations, we still see the signal of these 
uh, mutations. So published analyses had, you know, the uh, conclusion was that post-treatment, the tumor was eradicated. Uh, we find that post-treatment, uh, the tumor is not eradicated. There are still tumor cells uh, lurking around, just were invisible to the copy number analysis. So um, that's the uh, summary of, of uh, SBM clone uh, using the stochastic block model to actually do single nucleotide mutations from uh, 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 sparse uh, single cell sequencing data. And um, let me just very quickly, because it looks like I'm out of time, say something about the other technology, spatial transcriptomics, which, which you, you heard about already. So spatial transcriptomics is um, a great technology that's been developed for measuring um, gene expression, doing RNA sequencing while retaining the spatial location of each of the spots. Uh, and so it's recently been commercialized also by 10X Genomics, but there are various versions of this um, that, that have been published. So for gene expression from, from spatial information, we wanted to sort of twist this in a different way and say, could we actually detect copy number aberrations from spatial transcriptomics data? Uh, and, you know, the thinking here is that um, when there are large copy number aberrations, they do lead to changes in gene expression and to correlations in gene expression across large regions of the genome. This is a signal that's been, you know, uh, used in, in, in methods that have tried to predict copy number aberrations from uh, single cell RNA sequencing data like honey badger and infer CNV. And our sort of thought was with the spatial information, we get additional signal that we could use to identify copy number aberrations because uh, nearby regions of a tumor should likely, are likely to be genetically similar and to have uh, similar copy number aberrations. So the method we developed is, is called a, a starch. Um, it uh, takes spatial transcriptomics data and uh, tries to uh, identify a uh, a clone assignment for each spot where those clones are distinguished by different copy number aberrations. So we get a, a, a copy number profile for each of the clones and a clone assignment for, for each location. And I'll just show you quickly that in comparison to uh, methods that have been developed for single cell RNA-seq like in CMV that don't use spatial information, we get uh, much more robust results in terms of you know, our accuracy in, in, in inferring uh, uh, the clones. Um, this is from some spike-in data where we simulated spatial structure with real uh, single cell RNA and single cell DNA sequencing data. And we get uh, uh, you know, a much lower copy number distance here. This is distance from truth, so lower is better. So the spatial information really gives us uh, a good sort of signal to, to go on. I'll skip the part on real data and just sort of summarize there. So again, the idea is to you know, take um, through algorithmic analysis, take some of these new technologies and, and sort of get additional information out of them, maybe information that they weren't initially designed for, but uh, we can robustly pull out things like allele specific copy number or single nucleotide mutations or copy number aberrations from spatial transcriptomics. And I will end there and just acknowledge uh, the folks in my group who did the work. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, you have a question. You see the questions? Ah, I see the questions, yep. Uh, have you thought about integrating gene network data on the computational methods? Uh, is this possible? Um, and uh, I think, yes, um, it's possible. I think if, you know, by gene networks, um, one means perhaps, uh, uh, you know, genes that are, that are co-expressed or ones that, that physically interact. Um, we, we, we did do this. We, in fact, had a paper um, that was at Recom last year um, that did uh, network regularized NMF with uh, single cell RNA-seq data. So use prior information from, from gene co-expression to try to help um, uh, in, in inferring um, uh, cell clusters from single cell RNA-seq and co-expressed genes. Um, and we are interested in sort of using those ideas in the spatial transcriptomic setting as well. Okay, um, great, Ben, thank you. Um, so thank you so much for that talk uh, to all three speakers. So I wanna just, here, let me reshare. Let me stop this. Yeah, yeah, you wanna stop sharing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I just, here, let me, so, um, Oh, yeah, I, w I wanted just to say, uh, you know, thank you to the speakers, did really fantastic talks. I really want to thank Recom uh, for both 
hosting the session with us, but also for organizing a great conference. Um, it's fantastic. And particularly to the organizational team who organized a in-person conference um, that got canceled, organized a virtual conference. And as soon as they finish this, they're going to start organizing an in-person conference again for next year. So that's three conferences in, in two years, which is really impressive. Um, I also want to thank the organizing committee of CGSI. I want to thank the staff of CGSI uh, who put this together. And again, the speakers. And I, and I finally, you know, um, I, I want to I mention that these, the, we're going to put these videos of these talks online on the CGSI website. I also want to mention that all the talks from CGSI have been, uh, are on the, on the website. So we have hundreds and hundreds of, of talks that you can, you know, you can see right now. And the main thing I want to close with is that I really hope you'll join us next year uh, at CGSI uh, in person. Thank you. Aran, do you want to say anything? Or is that? No, you said it all. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating in this virtual CGSI. And hope to see you next year.